I wanted to just start uh, with gaining a common understanding of what we in fact uh, mean with with open. Um, as we look at, at open, I think we consider how we can best uh, remove barriers to how information is uh, accessed, to how software can be better uh, integrated within the technology infrastructure of libraries, and how we can uh, best remove barriers and enable more input in how library systems are developed and supported. And I think it comes down in this conversation as well to uh, more choice uh, for libraries uh, in how to uh, enable better access to information and uh, better services uh, for users. So uh, today we're going to be talking about how we uh, at EBSCO uh, are working to uh, remove barriers uh, and provide uh, choice uh, working with libraries uh, worldwide as we develop our suite of uh, products and, uh, and services. So as we think about um, the areas of open, we think about these areas uh, specifically. Um, the first is access to uh, scholarly literature, of course. And uh, this here, um, we look in this area, we look at the universe uh, of literature, whether open uh, access or traditional uh, literature. And in short, I think the focus here is access to the world's scholarly, scholarly literature and removing uh, barriers uh, to access uh, specifically. The uh, second area here refers to the services that libraries deliver uh, to uh, users and the infrastructure that uh, supports the applications and services uh, that libraries have in place. And the focus here is uh, interoperability. And the third area refers to uh, the platforms, the systems, software, the ability for libraries to more readily influence the uh, direction of uh, their software, uh, specifically how to manage and extend uh, the library services platform uh, to support evolving needs for library users and staff. And the focus here is open source uh, software. Now, I think our discussion here around uh, open starts with our thinking around open versus closed and what we believe are the actual barriers to an open uh, ecosystem and how we can uh, resolve or uh, address these. So the first barrier to open is lack of uh, equity in research. So if we think about access to the world's scholarly literature, we think about need to ensure equitable access so that any user can indeed uh, find and access uh, the literature from uh, across the globe in its many uh, different, its many uh, diverse manifestations. So we'll be going into some detail um, here as well around this idea of, of equity. The second uh, barrier to, uh, to open or to an open ecosystem is lack of interoperability. So if we think about how we best uh, can enable the discovery of scholarly literature and how libraries can offer the best possible services to users in this regard, uh, we need to think about connecting services or applications uh, that are best of breed and may in fact be uh, provided by different suppliers at times. So incompatible services, of course, are a barrier to deploying uh, best of breed services to users and ensuring uh, the uh, optimal discoverability and dissemination of information. So working uh, towards uh, or supporting interoperability between applications removes another barrier. The third barrier uh, we want to address, the third barrier to providing optimal services and indeed optimal workflows in support of research and the management of information uh, may well be uh, the very nature uh, of maybe the central system that is used in many libraries today, the integrated library system or the library services platforms. Uh, these systems are often proprietary in nature and libraries as a result are dependent on a single vendor uh, to extend the software or influence uh, its roadmap. And open source systems, by contrast, provide opportunities for more agency. They remove barriers 
for uh, how to develop, extend, and support these systems. So we're going to be spending time uh, on open source uh, as well. So what are we looking at at a high level? When it comes to equity in research, a few points. The first is the diversity and the trustworthiness of the content that we, as a service provider, index on our platforms. And we want and, in fact, need to ensure fair representation of research, of content from across the globe. And we, of course, also need to ensure the optimal discovery of content for any user through the strength of the uh, search technology, the user experience in our platforms, so that any user, regardless of background, level of expertise as a researcher, or the device that the user may be using, can find and access meaningful and relevant content for their, uh, for their research. Then on the second area, as it pertains to interoperability, meeting users where they are, and we'll provide some examples here, but users, of course, have different entry points for the research, and we need to be able to engage with uh, users when and where they do their, uh, do their work. And beyond this, we need to consider how we can deliver or improve library services for user, whether it's a researcher, a student, or, in, or staff in the library, by connecting uh, disparate applications and supporting end-to-end -end, uh, workflows. And then for open source, here we consider how to provide libraries with a system that offers more choice, choice to choose service providers, choice and input in how to uh, implement or uh, extend the library system to meet user needs. So this brings us to where we are focusing our efforts more specifically. So for open access literature, as for non-open access literature alike, curating the most trustworthy and diverse content, advancing our search technology and user experiences on our research platforms, for open infrastructure, uh, delivering and supporting uh, the interoperability of our uh, product suite with external services and applications that libraries may use, and then for open source support portfolio, the open, uh, the open source library services platform. So we will be looking at uh, these areas today across our products, specifically uh, EBSCO Discovery Service uh, EDS. Uh, we're also going to look at integrations, starting with uh, discovery within other environments, such as the learning management system, but beyond discovery, integrations that support library analytics to deliver improved uh, workflows. And we'll be giving some examples of these as you go through this presentation. And then lastly, we'll go into some detail around Folio and EBSCO's involvement uh, with uh, and the services that we provide for Folio, uh, looking at uh, the platform uh, benefits, its focus on flexibility and interoperability, and the services that, again, that we uh, provide for Folio, the open source library services platform. So let's start uh, by looking at our approach to curating and surfacing the most trustworthy, um, trustworthy information on our, on our platforms. So starting with open access, our approach is and always has been to index the world's scholarly literature. And I think it's important here to note that we treat open access the same as non-open access content. So what do we do? We curate the most trustworthy quality content from across the globe. We apply our search technology and underlying knowledge graph so that users can find the most relevant and meaningful results. Um, for their query, potentially across billions uh, of records. And the last point here is providing that personalized user experience and a modern experience in our platforms for any user to access, search, choose, and use content. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time here, maybe just giving a look here or a view of how we approach indexing and ac supporting access to content uh, through this type of a flow that I've put up here on the um, on this slide. So we start with trustworthy content, sourcing this content, and then of course we load and we index this content on our platforms. Next, we apply our search technology so we can surface the most relevant and most meaningful results for any query. 
And we're doing a lot of work here to expand our underlying, underlying knowledge graph where we map subjects and synonyms to different vocabularies so users can in fact explore topics across many different resources. Then in terms of the user experience itself, evolving the interface of our platforms to optimize how any user can access, search, choose, and use content. And the last point here regarding uh, integrations, and I touched on this earlier, is to meet users where they are so we can, we can uh, enable the findability and access to content from within many different environments. I think it's also important to emphasize what we consider uh, trustworthy content in general, not just looking at open access, but scholarly literature overall, and what we curate for indexing on our platforms. And I put some uh, criteria up here on, uh, on this slide. So we look at uh, sources that academic libraries in fact use. Uh, we ask or look at the journals that are indexed within key subject specific resources. Uh, which journals are included in citation indexes like uh, Web of Science and Scopus, and which uh, local sources are of relevance to our customers. And again, we apply these criteria for both non-open access content and open access content alike. For uh, open access specifically, just a few highlights of what we currently support in our platforms without reading each bullet. The important thing to keep in mind is that we index many thousands of publishers, including many partner resources, where we index their publications for inclusion uh, in EBSCO Discovery Service and our research platform. I've listed some examples of these open access uh, database resources here. In terms of indexing, uh, we index um, uh, DOAJ, so the Directory of Open Access Journals metadata in EDS. We support on paywall. We provide access to different open access collections, including open access monographs, open educational resources, open dissertations, and so forth. So we talked about trustworthy and meaningful content in the process um, and the criteria that we use when we index uh, the content on our platforms. Now I want to talk a little bit about uh, search and subject precision, an area uh, that underlies much of our work to ensure equitable access to information. So a few notes in here in terms of what we in fact include content wise as we consider the quality and depth uh, and breadth of data that's being searched by our users. We need to ensure that we have the most comprehensive coverage uh, of subject areas and full text searching of scholarly journals and books from publishers, from university presses, from scholarly societies. I should also note here that we ensure that no predatory journals, meaning journals that include articles of dubious quality or legitimacy, are included in our uh, databases. And this is an ongoing process. And our own staff who are, who are uh, librarians review the journals and also flag any titles for review based on Cabell's list which is a report that we uh, receive each month and, and review. Now, while full text searching is useful for completeness, precision is necessary when users are retrieving, in fact, thousands or millions of articles and books. And this is where uh, subject uh, indexes come in. So nearly every area of study has some kind of authoritative subject index. Uh, psychology has APA Sec Info, engineering has INSPEC, nursing has CINAHL, and so forth. And subject indexes are, in essence, these high quality mini discovery services for, di for their uh, respective disciplines. So by leveraging, by using a subject indexing in our search technology, uh, rather than placing a focus on article title searching or full text searching uh, only, we support precision in the, precision in the uh, search experience and provide better uh, matches at the top of the results list. So to give some example here, as we were talking about sub subject indexes uh, being fundamental to uh, in-depth discovery, keeping our objective in mind, we want to provide users with an equitable search experience, meaning you do not need to be an expert user to get expert results. And we want to deliver a meaningful results for any query. So we do this through a knowledge graph by mapping subjects to different vocabularies and their natural language uh, equivalents. 
What this means is that a user who may not know the exact term to use or which database resource to consult will find all relevant and accurate uh, results for their search query. And I put an example here on this on the slide. If a user searches, say, for maglev, which is a particular system of train transportation, then the user will get results based on both the proper subject terms as well as a natural language equivalent, in this case, high speed train, right, for that search term. So, in the end, regardless of the user's level of expertise, the user receives the most accurate results for this uh, concept of maglev trains. If you take a step back, provide a sense of how we approach search and discovery at a high level, again, to ensure that we help any user find the most relevant uh, information for any uh, query. It starts, starts with our search algorithm and how we rank results. You can go to our website or just Google relevance ranking to see an explanation. As I mentioned earlier, the first priority is to match on subject headings from control, uh, controlled vocabularies. Next, we map subjects to different vocabularies and their natural language equivalents, so we can provide users with the broadest, but also most relevant and meaningful set of results. And then users can also see the relationship between subjects in our concept map. So in the end, discovery, of course, must provide new insights, help users explore the universe of research. So by continuously expanding our knowledge graph, we can deliver our to users, no matter who they are or where they are from, with those new insights in their areas of study or inquiry. Okay, going now from uh, discussing our search technology to the user experience. So the fundamentals of user experience, users have grown uh, accustomed to a certain journey and certain experiences on commercial websites, Think about personalized dashboards, uh, sharing options, recommendation capabilities. We are learning from these experiences. We're also taking an evidence-based approach in our product development, learning from user behaviors and expectations across these commercial solutions, but also synthesizing these with expectations specifically for the library. We conduct our own user research here, but we also get feedback from libraries directly through user group meetings, focus groups, advisory boards, surveys, and so forth. So what does this, uh, what does this mean? We think about access, search, choose, and use. And these are really the stages of um, the uh, library user's journey. And as I mentioned earlier, users take similar journeys with Netflix, with Amazon, Spotify, or Google. So rather than reinvent the wheel, the user interface of uh, EBSCO host, of EBSCO discovery service, we combine popular features that we find in commercial websites with functionality that's necessary for libraries. And the important thing here is that we remove barriers in the user journey and enable a seamless experience for any user with the library's uh, resources. So more specifically, the things that we look at, uh, where with what, how do users in fact access uh, resources? What devices do they use? How do they authenticate? From which environments uh, do they come? How does the user uh, go about searching for what they're looking for? What is their search strategy? Uh, how does the user choose what resources are useful to them? Right? What kinds of tasks does the user complete? Uh, with their chosen resources? How do they archive, annotate, present their work? So what does this mean? We talked about the journey, but when they encounter the user interface, what do they see? What options uh, do they get? And here our uh, platforms focus uh, on delivering uh, the features, the functionality that users have come to expect, personalized dashboards, for example, to manage projects, to see previously conducted queries, but also ways to easily start research through Wikipedia-like research starters, to like items, to have an easy way to use them, to cite an article, add to a project, share or download from within the results list, and then have a modern way to also read an ebook through uh, an ebook, modern ebook reader, enabling the user to download individual chapters, to search within the ebook itself. And I'm just showing here a few examples of features uh, that uh, we're building in and making available in our product uh, interfaces. And it's also important to note that we always take a privacy first approach uh, to personalization. So upholding 
library values around user privacy and data ethics at any time. Lastly here to highlight a few things that we emphasize in the user journey and user experience uh, on our platforms as we support equity, equity through this platform experience. First, it goes without saying that we support access for any uh, user, including the visually impaired, support standards-based authentication, authentication and single sign-on to make the user experience with a library and its resources as seamless as possible. Examples include SAML compliant identity solutions, support for Open Athens. It goes uh, also without saying that we support cross device research. So users may use their uh, mobile device for an initial search and then continue on their desktop or laptop. So it's about carrying that experience over. And then integrations. Consider that users may start within other environments, such as the learning management system. And here it's imperative that we also support easy linking to the full text of an article. So let's talk about integrations next. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing and hand over to Richard. Thank you very much, Tamir. Let me just share a screen. Okay, so can one of my colleagues just confirm that you can see my screen saying open integrations and interoperability. Okay, yep, so um, my name is Richard Burkett, as I introduced myself a little earlier on, and I'm going to speak um, about those integrations and about that interoperability. Um, this stuff gets exciting for me, so I'm going to have to make sure that I slow down a little bit. So we're focused on driving the ideas of open across our services in many different ways. So I want to touch on this in brief, looking at how we support system interoperability. And on the left-hand side, you can see that our services for discovery, our knowledge base, Gobi, EBSCOnet, for ordering, Panorama, um, for analytics, we build these solutions specifically for interoperability. On the right-hand side, we see examples of systems that we may integrate with. For example, we work with learning management systems or virtual learning environments, dependent on um, your terminology like Canvas, Moodle, desire to learn through our LTI connector. And this brings discovery and the VLE or LMS closer together. And of course, as Tamir said just earlier, we've got to be where students are in order to retain our relevancy. We also use Panorama Analytics to visualize data from systems like Folio, of course, but also systems like Alma and Sierra, because we want to include that interoperability um, in as many ways as we possibly can. Moving into the user interface, uh, in this case, the, the new EBSCO discovery service, we, we want to look at the open integrations and interoperability to include not just the APIs that EBSCO develops, but the ability to bring in other services um, on their own. So libraries should have the ability to choose those services that work best for that specific library to make sure that you have the tools to engage with problem solving at your library. And of course, where possible, these need to be standards based integrations to en enable seamless interoperability with these integrations. So we see here some examples, libguides, libances, as well as database recommendations based on the search conducted by the user. Moving on, although EBSCO has got a huge amount of indexed results, as Tamir's covered earlier on today. We also address those resources that are outside of the discovery index. And you can see these and how they are um, integrated into the new EDS user interface uh, by bringing in a wealth of new features and looking at those resources that are not indexed within the supplemental, supplementary sources area. Mentioning that LTI um, connector, it's very, very important that um, as part of this presentation, we, we understand that integration is, is really forefront of EBSCO's uh, mind. And we want to make sure that tools that maybe exist outside of the library, maybe in, in so far as the, um, the, the virtual learning environment, the VLE or the, the LMS exists at the university level rather than the library level, 
and that um, the staff may mandate uh, student users to go to these tools. We need to make sure that the library retains its relevance by putting the tools that we have um, into the, uh, the systems that are used by students. And as such, we're going to where the audience is. And this is through the, the LTI connection. Moving over to analytics and a new service, which is called Panorama from EBSCO. This seeks to take data from sources that have been historically siloed. Um, and in doing so, we create dashboards that show data visualization um, in a wide variety of, of different outputs. And these, uh, these ensure that you can make and enable decision-making at multiple levels within the institution. So these data come from a variety of different sources um, and they can be put together um, and displayed uh, both the physical items, electronic items, and um, usage of resources, um, really, really very granular information. And of course, once we have this information uh, displayed in this case through, through Tableau, then we're able to, uh, to subscribe to these resources um, and get those reports delivered directly to us. And it doesn't have to be that this integrates with Folio. This integrates with existing library uh, systems that you may have in place at the moment, and they include Sierra and Alma as well. Quite recently, uh, we had the, the press release that came from, uh, from, from TALIS. As you probably know, um, TALIS Aspire is a reading list and, uh, and it's, it's very well used um, around the UK and other parts of the world. And Okanagan College in Canada were one of the first sites to implement uh, TALIS Aspire, their reading list. They were also one of the first Canadian sites to implement Folio, the open source library services platform. And uh, it speaks well to both of these technologies that they can actually um, inter interoperate uh, between themselves uh, to make sure that the, uh, the, the, the service that is provided by these two um, systems um, ensures the, the workflows are supported. And moving on to the, um, the, the more of the EBSCO world and, and interoperations there. We've got an example here of Gobi, which you probably know is a, a provider of ebook, print books, and workflow services to libraries around the world. And Gobi partners with an enormous number of different library system vendors and library systems through its APIs to make sure that it can interoperate. And the adage here really is that there is a choice for a library about what they would like to use and what best suits their needs. So because these systems are fully integrated, then Gobi customers using Folio, for example, will benefit from a streamlined book selection and acquisition workflow, which essentially when an ebook or a print book is ordered within Gobi, it's seamlessly reflected in Folio with the purchase order number and the bib record and all of the necessary detail. So moving on to open source more specifically. So I'm, I'm sure you're all very much aware that we've had changes within the, the library vendor ecosystem for quite some time. And there's many ways that this can impact you, the, the end user. Um, we've seen an awful lot of consolidation and that means that there are fewer companies to give you options for what you would like to purchase and the workflows essentially that you'd like to be supported. So we now see a handful of different systems that are supported by a smaller handful of vendors who build solutions within a single monolithic framework. We think of this very often as the walled garden and that approach is, is somewhat outdated considering that modern software technology around the world outside of libraries um, increasingly allows you to have the choice of applications to put on top of open platforms which allow you more choice, they allow you more input in how to deploy and manage, and also to extend this software to support your workflows. So this is where the Folio project really came about. As a result of the recognition that choice is limited, interoperability and extensibility may be lacking, and that the vendor library relationship um, had to change to support more choice and more innovation. Folio's at its heart, a community-driven 
library services platform. It's open source, yet it's supported by many vendors, including EBSCO and our worldwide partners. So with Folio, libraries can work with different vendors and different teams who contribute towards the development of applications in their areas of expertise. It's not a monolithic system. It uses small apps and a, a different architecture to enable libraries to enjoy easier updates and the benefit of rapid development, as well at the core of Folio are open APIs. And as a result, it's easier to integrate with existing systems and provide libraries with more choice for services that they have today and also ongoing into the future. Folio is different insofar as it is community owned. And the community of peers that we have within Folio, they contribute to, they very significantly influence the direction of the Folio software. And a key approach to Folio is that it relies on the microservices architecture. And without going into too many details, the architecture allows the, for the development of smaller applications, apps, that can be contributed to by different teams. So say from different libraries or different vendors um, supporting different geographies. Uh, this approach means that we can have Folio developed to suit particular workflows within particular environments. It's a non-monolithic approach and we can support this rapid innovation because of those architectural decisions that were made a long time ago when, when Folio was just an idea. And those API, open APIs that support the interoperability, they support choice. They support choice of not having to rely on a particular single vendor, not having to be um, served up a very limited amount of applications or indeed integrations. Moreover, because Folio is open source, it can be extended in support of where libraries want to go next and where the platform needs to be delivered. So Folio is truly a community project. Um, it's a global project. Uh, in the US, the community has been formed by many libraries, both large and small. And it's important that we do not just call out large libraries. Um, all libraries have um, challenges, uh, whether they're large or small. And what Folio seeks to do is to address these challenges and the challenges that have been faced by, by older legacy systems. These libraries really, they, they share a common goal of making their systems more suited to modern workflows. Of course, Folio is not just about the US. Um, Folio is about democratizing cutting edge library technologies around the world. And so these libraries you see right now, these are libraries who are actively involved uh, within the, the Folio community. And of course, there are far more, but here we see representation from New Zealand, from South Africa, from China, Brazil, as well as the UK and Europe. So speaking about Folio and, and its apps. So the Folio open source library services platform is both a community project and an EBSCO service. The apps within, the, within Folio, they, they communicate together and they support activities such as acquisitions or ERM, electronic resource management. These applications are frequently part of multiple workflows, and so they're reused. EBSCO leverages the community applications as well as having our own apps as well. As such, Folio from EBSCO is a powerful resource to support the workflows of the library today. But because of the architecture of Folio and the applications that are being developed to snap in, those applications are going to make Folio the system for the future as well as today. Folio iterates very quickly. Back in uh, the beginning of the deployment of Folio in, in, in very early 2019, uh, we, we launched the Aster release. And you'll notice here, uh, being colleagues from the library, that these are A to Z, A to Z. And we have moved um, through to the, the Kiwi release, which we're looking forward to um, in November. And these are all names of flowers. Um, the, the, the community um, has taken the logo of Folio as a bee, and the shape that you see in front of you uh, are hexagons, uh, and so it doesn't take much imagination to, uh, to work out that this is about people working together 
just like bees may work together. And of course, bees like flour. So we develop very quickly, we iterate rapidly. We have, um, we have three named releases per year. And these releases are around about um, the 70 features added per release. So they're very significant and they're very frequent. And this means that we can charge after those features and functionalities that the community um, wants to hear about. And of course, because Folio is open, you can read about all of this. Indeed, you can do more than read about it. You can become part of this. So how is this all organized? Well, the Folio community, it is a, a very organized um, group of uh, interested individuals and organizations. So starting at the top left there, we have the product council. This uh, elected body, they are responsible for the roadmap and deciding the way that the, the roadmap um, is presented. These are the wishes and hopes of the Folio community as a whole. Now that's underpinned by the technical council, which advises on the best way to achieve the goals that the, uh, that the Folio community has, which of course feeds into the product roadmap. The special interest groups or SIGs, these are, these are folks who have real deep domain experience, maybe in um, metadata management or in acquisitions, et cetera. And these will, um, these will form the ideas that are presented to the technical council and the product council that become part of the roadmap. And in terms of product management, EBSCO contributes our professional project management, product management, sorry, uh, to ensure that the roadmap is, um, is, is held on behalf of the Folio community. And so EBSCO deploys the roadmap um, on behalf of um, Folio members. But of course, that roadmap needs to be uh, having, having elements developed um, for deployment. And so development resource is applied by EBSCO and other um, teams around the world. And these are agile teams that deploy the software to be included in the code for Folio. Of course, EBSCO can also develop its own applications to be deployed within the EBSCO um, Folio service. And then in terms of the support that's offered, EBSCO has a series of around 20 or 25 partners around the world, and they are um, highly skilled in library systems implementation and support. And so it's not just EBSCO um, providing support. You can have local geographical support, local language support, local understanding of workflows, as well as having EBSCO do implementations. And of course, EBSCO also hosts uh, Folio on behalf of our customers. The note to take away from this is that with Folio, we've got you covered and you don't need to additionally hire staff. Uh, we have all the resource that will be necessary. Moving on to the services that EBSCO uh, has available and are deploying right now. So EBSCO has got implementation teams around the world. And this means that we have the ability to implement Folio ourselves um, in, a, in, a, in a very uh, professional manner. Um, we've done this in, in many circumstances and we're ready to implement Folio and analyze the workflows that you have within your library. We can implement Folio as a full system, uh, which is print electronic resources, of course, but we can also implement the electronic resource management elements of Folio as well. And these both are underpinned by the EBSCO global knowledge base. We can also integrate with EBSCO applications, as we've spoken about earlier on in this presentation, as well as those third party applications, for example, the Talus Aspire system. What we want to do in terms of implementation is provide the library with an understanding of their workflows and the system that is uh, able to uh, be deployed and support the workflows that the library has now and going into the future. That's deployed on the EBSCO hosting environment, which is Amazon Web Services. And this is a very high availability, very high performance system that we have um, continually monitored. Of course, we have security and privacy at the center of our hosting environments as well. And then moving into support, we have um, a, a very large team of support professionals 
that look to support all of EBSCO's products and services. And my hope is that you will have had positive engagements with those, um, those colleagues of mine. But we also support this in terms of folio, of course. And so we have um, human beings, as you'd expect, but we also have forums and we have, um, we have people within the EBSCO and our partner network that perform all the partner, all, all the support um, arrangements that you would need when deploying um, a library services platform. Moving on to a, a couple of quotes by Massey University in New Zealand. Massey is um, it's the first library in New Zealand to move to Folio. Um, it's got a, a history of being the first, but not the last. And what I take from this, I what, I, what I'd like you to take from this is that um, this was a future focused decision. Um, and, and Massey say that Folio offers immediate improvements in the functionality that will benefit our library patrons. But we expect those to be far outweighed by the benefits Folio future development will bring. And I think that's a really eloquent way of stating where, where Folio is. Folio works really well now. It offers improvements right now. But in the future, because of those architectural decisions that allow um, apps to be um, integrated and third party software to be integrated um, and Folio to be developed by the community, it means that the future is very, very bright indeed. Another um, quote that comes from Cornell University. Um, Cornell, are, uh, they, they've adopted Folio and they, they use the full Folio system. Um, and I shan't read this out to you, but I'm sure you can read it yourself, but the open source nature of Folio, the collaborative nature of Folio is really something that grasped Cornell very, very um, hard. Uh, and it's great to see that that's a system of record at, at such a prestigious library. So moving into a slide that you will have seen uh, the, the first part of um, in my, my first part of the, the session. But I want to elaborate really on the interoperability slide that I showed earlier. Here we've got EBSCO services and they're interoperating with Folio. And this is done because of the openness of Folio and the API gateway that forms such an integral part of the Folio architecture. But it also means that other services can work with Folio and such as those you can see on the right. However, this is, this is just a selection. This is limited by our, our own imaginations. Yes, of course, you know, we have ILL development and we can work with preservation and, and all sorts of different things. But what we want is for people to say, hey, wouldn't it be good if we worked with more, um, more parts of the information um, architectures within your own local geography? because that's what Folio has been built for. Folio has been built to connect your entire ecosystem together and make it meaningful and make it support the workflows that you have now and those going into the future. So a little about the, uh, the open community, and this is EBSCO's open community. It's, it's just a few words on something that I think you'll find very interesting, um, particularly for this group when we're talking about open. So EBSCO has launched quite recently our open community, and it's intended to be a forum for discussion on really all things open. It's, um, it, it's, it's a, a place that you can go to find a good deal of information right now. Um, there are people at EBSCO and elsewise who are writing information to put into this, um, this portal. And, and we welcome your input to this as well please do go to communities.ebsco.com and become involved in this conversation. And tell us what you think. Now, wrapping up a little here, um, and this is, uh, this is obviously a slide that you have seen before from Tamir. Uh, at a high level, in terms of our products and services, I, I hope you'd agree that we're focusing really quite, quite a lot on, on open. And... For open access, we're supporting equitable access to the world's scholarly literature. We're treating open access the same as non-open access by curating trustworthy and diverse content, providing any user the means to search for, access, choose, and use that content. And we discussed that our efforts here are to focus on the underlying search technology, leveraging of subject indexing, of course, to ensure that precision in the search, expanding our knowledge graph connecting subjects, 
and concepts together, supporting natural language searching, as well as the evolution of the user experience and the interface actually on our platforms, both EBSCO Discovery Service and EBSCO Host. In terms of the open infrastructure, our focus here is to deliver the integrations and support interoperability of the EBSCO um, product suite and, and search technology with external application services and environments. A good example of this is integrating discovery with the learning management system, of course. And other examples include integrating EBSCO discovery service with platforms like Alma and WMS, uh, Gobi integrations with Folio, as well as other platforms. And a lot of our work here focuses on developing and extending our APIs. Really, the, the last point here for open source is that support for open source software, specifically for Folio, the open source library services platform, is that this is offering an openness and an interoperability that provides a system that libraries really haven't had before. It provides a, peer, a community of peers and it provides the choice that libraries require to deploy and manage that software. Um, it gives you a voice, it gives you agency, um, and EBSCO is there to support those voices and that agency. So thank you very much, and I shall uh, turn over my uh, presentation to my colleagues. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Tamir. So we did have a couple of questions come in. The first one was, um, I'm based in the Netherlands. Do you provide local support for Folio? So can you repeat, please? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yes, sorry. Okay. Um, the first question that came in was, I am based in the Netherlands. Do you provide local support for Folio? Oh yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, I mentioned that we've got sort of around sort of the 25 different partners around the world. And in the Netherlands, we've got a partner called Migrator. And these guys, um, they provide the implementation and uh, migration support services, whereas EBSCO provides the hosting of Folio. So we actually work in collaboration uh, with Migrator to deliver that service, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, one other question. So you talked a lot about interoperability. If I use Alma, will I be able to also use Panorama? Yeah, absolutely, um, without a doubt. We, um, we've developed Panorama from really from the ground up to be able to integrate with a very wide variety of information silos. And so whether that is you know, Alma or Sierra or, or, or whatever other, um, library system, we, we integrate with those to provide those, uh, those visualizations. So yes, absolutely, we do that. Okay, and I think I'll ask one last question, um, and then I know we are over time. So can you talk a little bit more about the work that you are doing with DOAJ? Yeah, I, I can take I can take that uh, question. Thanks, thanks for that question. So uh, we index uh, DOAJ metadata, so Director of Open Access Journals, a metadata in uh, EDS, an EBSCO Discovery Service. So we retrieve records from DOAJ and we link users to the uh, article uh, via the um, the DOAJ platform. Uh, so as a result, in fact, we generate a lot more referrals to DOAJ. I think than probably any other uh, online platform. So hopefully the answer is we, uh, again, we, we retrieve these records, we index um, we index on our platform, then we uh, link users to the articles for the DOHA platform. Perfect. Um, hopefully the difference is. came in around whether the presentation will be available and we will be sharing a recording of the presentation later this week to everyone who did register. And with that, I wanted to thank our participants for your questions and for taking the time out of your day to attend the webinar. We hope you found the session informative and engaging. We will compile the rest of the questions and get back to you personally. And a big thanks to Richard and Tamir for sharing their insights. And we hope to see you all again soon. Thank you and have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.